and liftoff. The year in space starts now. Kelly, Kornienko and Padaka on their way towards the International Space Station. This was the launch last Sunday from the Cosmodrome in Central Asia, beginning two adventures, the first of their kind in history. Fox News reporter Phil Keating continues the story. Identical twin astronauts Mark and Scott Kelly are embarking on space and Earth history. Yeah, there's two major sections of the space station. Scott, who spent six months living aboard the space station before, is now doubling down. In a landmark study, he'll live in space for one year, all to see what happens and prepare us for going to Mars. To have this unique opportunity to be the first American to do this, and, you know, I do feel, feel very grateful and uh, feel like I am in a privileged uh, position, even though it's going to be a tough flight being in space for that long. Before a six-month trip just to get to Mars, we need to learn much more about the physiological drain, mental effects, and health issues caused by near-zero gravity and interstellar radiation. My hope is that we discover that the mitigation steps we've, we've come up with for the bone and the muscle loss are effective and they, you know, they work. The vision uh, problem we have is much different. I mean, we don't really understand why that's even happening. Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko will also live the next year in space, but since Scott Kelly has a genetic replica in Mark, scientists will study him too. That's a long time. I mean, it really is. It's, you know, uh, yeah. A year of doing anything is a really long time. You do miss miss the weather and the seasons, but the thing you miss most are the uh, the human relationships you have with your the friends and family and people you love on the ground. Scott Kelly will be able to email and make occasional phone calls to his two kids and girlfriend down in Houston, all while looking out that porthole window as home revolves 250 miles beneath him. In Miami, Phil Keating. Fox News. Good Sunday morning, everybody. We have such a special treat today. We have an astronaut with us, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giggling more than you're laughing, Dr. <laughs> Garrett uh, Reisman. Um, let's let's set yours the stage for you. You've been up twice. Uh, yes, uh, two missions. The first in 2008, mm -hmm. and that was on board Endeavor, which is right here now in LA at the Science Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second mission was on board Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2010. And you were gone a total of, it's more than three months altogether. Yes, it was a total of 107 days, but uh, broken up into the first mission was 95 days, and then the second mission was about two weeks. And that was actually kind of a bummer, I have to tell you. Why? Because it, it was only 95 days the first time, okay. and if you stay for 100, you get a patch. Oh. <laughs> so. You have a chance to go back? Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah, you, well, you never know. Uh, uh, maybe I'll get that patch one of these days. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you should. But then um, the thing that a lot of viewers would not be aware of is that you've been way up there, but you've also been way down in the, the ocean. That's right. I actually got in a little bit of trouble for that. So, so what you're referring to is uh, we did a practice exercise called the Nemo mission, uh -huh. where we lived for about two weeks in the bottom of the sea, about 60 feet down off the coast of Florida. And that was to simulate the, the isolation that we had face aboard the space station. Mm -hmm. And the reason I kind of got in trouble for that was that my wife is an oceanographer. Oh, oh. So we had this deal where like I would take sea level and above and she would get sea level and below <laughs> and I kind of violated that <laughs> pretty badly. But yeah. Well, the point is that you you know the extremes and in in reference to a year in space, you know what it's like to be deprived of uh of gravity as we know it, for one thing, and uh, a variety of human contact. What, what's it like? What's it going? What's Scott doing these days up there? Or is it Mark? I can never remember. It's, it's Scott. It's Scott. <laughs> it's Scott. Yes. Yeah, Mark is still down here. I had dinner with him just two nights ago here How in, is he in doing? LA, and he's doing great. Uh, uh, he's got a whole bunch of. The, I think he was here to uh, yeah, tape yeah, Celebrity yeah. Jeopardy. So he's having a lot of fun <laughs> while his brothers up there. Uh, but uh, but Scott's up on orbit, and he'll be there for a whole year. Um, and uh, I, I refer to my time, my three-month stay, as a Goldilocks mission because, in my opinion, <laughs> it was long enough that you get the full impact of being up there. After about a month is when you first get the feeling that this is normal. You know, in the first couple of weeks, it's completely surreal that everything is floating and the earth is out the window. It's just crazy. But after about a month, you start getting used to it, and, and it's neat to get to that point. And I enjoy that for another two months. But I didn't have to stay for a whole year. So uh, it was kind of like Goldilocks, meaning 
it was not too long, not too short. It was kind of yeah. just right. Yeah. So uh, as, as land-based people, we, we've all seen these images like these of, of men and women floating around out there in space. But it, there's more adjustment that needs to be done than just floating around. What other sorts of things? Well, well first of all, to point out the floating around for me was the best part. Uh, it was the most exciting thing. And we talk about floating around, but really, once you push away from a solid surface, mm -hmm. you go shooting across that space station like you're Superman. Oh. It's like you can fly. And that is uh, thrilling. It was so much fun, just as much fun on day 95 as it was on day one. <laughs> uh, and uh, I loved it. So um, I missed that. Uh, but, there's, but you're right. The, the, you go through a big adjustment phase. Uh, the body goes through a really interesting adjustment and the first thing that hits you right away is your vestibular system, your, your sense of balance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Because, because the inner ear, which provides the information to the brain about your, your, your balance, is not, doesn't work at all without gravity. So it's sending all this kind of bogus information up to your brain, and your brain gets very confused. And your eyes, on the other hand, are uh, telling the brain that I'm not spinning, but this your inner ear is saying you're spinning. And so the brain gets confused and you feel kind of like you're seasick uh, for until your brain gets used to it. That would make sense. But then what about other things? Um, well, I'm, look, we're all adults here, right? Mm -hmm. What about other things that we take for granted, like going to the bathroom? Uh -huh. I knew you were going there. <laughs> everybody does. Everybody, wants, later, to, everybody wants to know the answer to that question. <laughs> that's, right. a, that's, a, that's the number one question. Uh, it's funny, I get that question from kindergarten kids and I, I've gotten it from world leaders and Nobel Prize winners, so you're in good company. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, how do I put this? Um, the, basically, going to the bathroom up there, it works essentially the same way as it does down here on Earth, except that instead of having gravity to assist things in going away, away uh, you rely on a little bit of air suction. Uh -huh. And that's how it works. And how... How much time does it take for you to get used to that? I don't think I ever got used to that. <laughs> it's, not, it's not one of the more, um, yeah, it's not one of, if I was putting together a brochure for a space tourist, I wouldn't put that in there. It's yeah. not one of the more glamorous aspects of space mm -hmm. travel. Mm -hmm. um, and I, because I got to tell you, even though the air suction takes the place of gravity, mm -hmm. gravity is way better. Okay. Much better. We will all have to take your word for it. The uh, is breathing the same? Because you're breathing. Oh, yeah. You're breathing. Is it is it a combination of hydrogen and oxygen, or what? It's uh, nitrogen. Oh, is, is it nitrogen? Nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen, yeah, nitrogen and oxygen. And oxygen yeah. yeah, it's about eighty twenty mm -hmm. nitrogen to oxygen, and uh, the, yeah, the mix we use up on the space station is basically the same mix that we're breathing right now. Uh -huh. Fourteen point seven psi, eighty twenty. Uh, so it's basically air at, uh -huh. at sea level pressure. Uh, the only time that differs is when you do a spacewalk. When you do a spacewalk, you actually have to lower the pressure because if you filled up the suit with that much pressure, y it would be very hard to move. It would be rigid. Mm -hmm. It would be like a, mm -hmm. a really overinflated balloon. Mm -hmm. So the suit works at down under four pounds per square inch. And, um, and so you have to gradually go down uh, to that pressure, just like a scuba diver has to be careful about not going up to the surface too fast. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, the, uh, will, will Scott be uh, taking any spacewalks on this mission? I'm not sure if they have, that's a good question, I'm not sure if they have any planned, but there's always the possibility that something goes wrong. And a lot of the equipment on the space station is on the outside. Uh -huh. And there are spare parts for all that equipment. So if they find that one of these things breaks, he might be tasked to go out the door and... Uh, is that the term that you use? Going out the door? Colloquially, yeah, that's what we, that's how we talk about it, yeah. What was it like for you the first time you, you, uh, you did that? Boy, it was amazing. Uh, the, the, that, the floating thing on a day-to-day -day basis was the most fun, but doing a spacewalk was by far and away the most exciting thing about any of my missions. And I was fortunate enough to get to do three of them. And on the first one, I remember opening up that hatch and poking my head out, and it was at night. And so all I was doing was peering out into pure blackness. It felt like, it felt like it was so dark that it looked almost like it was viscous, like it was ink. Uh -huh. And I and I actually took my hand and I and I and I ran my fingers like this uh, through space, thinking that I would feel it because it looked that that looked like India ink or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. 
And then the sun came up and it was spectacular. <laughs> oh, but there's that notion of uh, you must have been checking your tether and making sure that oh, yeah. you were not going to go floating away? Yeah, no, you don't want to go floating away. And yeah, there's, there's that. In fact, the, the, I had a mantra on that first spacewalk. After the second or third one, I was kind of used to it. But the first one, uh, my mantra was don't squeeze too tight. You know, I kept saying don't, don't grab, don't grab, because there's a uh, tendency, because of the adrenaline, because of you're staring down at the earth uh, and, and you're a couple hundred miles up and you're shooting through space, there's this tendency to grab onto those handrails with a death grip, mm -hmm. really strong. And the problem is, is that you call it spacewalk, but that's really a misnomer because you don't really walk at all. You're, it's more like a space crawl. You're using your arms for everything. Oh. And if you squeeze too tight, uh, you'll use up all that muscle endurance in the first couple of minutes. You have about seven and a half hours that you need to rely on those muscles for. So if you use it all up right away, that's bad news. Uh, so I try to relax, and it's not so easy to do that. If you'll forgive me for being morbid, we have had some, we have, we've lost some lives uh, on, on uh, launches as well as landings. Um, is it inevitable that we're going to lose somebody or have a catastrophic incident during one of these spacewalks? Boy, you know, that's a very perceptive question because uh, statistically doing a spacewalk is almost pretty much as dangerous as launching and landing. Those are the three most dangerous things you could do. And it's actually statistically improbable that we haven't had a major problem up to this point because we've done so many spacewalks, mm -hmm. especially to construct a space station. There, We did lots and lots of spacewalks. So... I'll tell you when, and, and you saw the movie Gravity probably, it's, mm -hmm. it's not quite that dramatic, but um, it's true that there's a lot of debris out there. And during my first spacewalk, we had to bring a handle back inside that we were going to use on a subsequent spacewalk. And when we went to get that handle, and we brought it inside, we saw this, this handle was made of half-inch thick solid aluminum, mm -hmm. and there was a hole shot straight through it, about a millimeter in diameter. It looked like somebody took a cocktail straw and just put it right through the aluminum and a very clean bore and a little bit of an exit wound at the back, mm -hmm. but it clearly shot straight through. And my, my spacewalk partner looked at that and looked up at me and said, boy, if that hit one of us. Yeah. And it would have been immediately catastrophic if that had happened, so he didn't have to finish that statement. Well, there goes my question about having close calls. Yeah, that's one of them. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> More stories from the doctor when we come back. Stay with us.